Hi, everyone, and welcome to San Francisco Public Library's Jail and Reentry Services Department's training on academic library services to incarcerated people. This training is part of our training series made possible by the Mellon Foundation for our Expanding Information Access for Incarcerated People grant project. We cover a variety of topics in this training in training series related to all types of library services and information services for incarcerated people. And the trainings will be publicly available on our YouTube channel and available through ALA's learning management software. They're freely available through ALA if you would like to receive professional credit um, or a certificate for attending this training. All you have to do is sign up through ALA's learning management system. We'll start the training today with an introduction by Stacey Burnett, speaking about her own lived experiences with information access inside. And then we'll hear from a variety of librarians in a variety of contexts who are working with currently incarcerated students. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Stacey Burnett, and pretty soon I can officially tack three letters after my name, MBA. It's been a rather unusual path to get here at almost 50 years old, and my very first college class was taken in prison. In 2008, I was sentenced to five to 10 years in New York State, and it was a terrible time. I was struggling to find meaning, and at the sentencing hearing, I promised the judge I would emerge with a college degree. I hadn't known anyone who had been to prison before, but based on what I had read and thought I knew about prisons, I thought criminals were coddled and got free educations and that prisons were idyllic places. We just couldn't leave them. A giant rent-free college campus with bars. I was disavowed of that notion within an hour of my arrival at Bedford Hills. Uh, we were publicly deloused. I was yelled at for not rubbing the lay shampoo in quick enough and standing in that shower stall waiting those five agonizing minutes for that lice treatment to work being screamed at by guards, I felt my humanity just being stripped away. It was going down the drain with those little soap bubbles in that cold water. And I was grateful when I got that scratchy green button up, button up shirt to cover myself. I would have to wear this shirt for five years. I was 0378, but I vowed that I would be 0378 with a bachelor's by the time it was over. Bedford had a college program, but I was shipped out before I could attend any of those classes. I was off to Albion, which is the largest New York State uh, prison for women. There was college, but I was too old for it. No one over 24 could attend because it was paid for by a youth grant. Three out of five New York State prisons had college programs, um, but statistically, I thought I would have the opportunity I wound up doing almost all my time at the only two facilities that did not have college for me, and I was angry. I spent five years scrubbing floors, mopping sewage, fixing broken appliances uh, in between stints and solitary, which was not idyllic at all. I took writing classes, parenting classes, religious classes, classes on anything, but nothing that gave me college credit, and I was still seeking, I, I was still seeking something. Um, when I tried to apply for college after I went home from prison the first time, I was rejected because I had to check off that box for felon. I went back to prison two more times because prison is tough, but the last time something magical happened, I landed at Taconic, which offered Bard Prison Initiative. I applied and I, I cried a lot alone in my cell staring at that acceptance letter because I was accepted. It was finally happening. For six hours a day, I was in this idyllic place. I was not in prison. I was in a cave with Plato. I was inside the walls of medieval Europe doing primitive accumulation. I was in that godforsaken field for 200 pages of Anna Karenina. And I was learning, but I was also relearning how to question I had been so wrong about prisons before I stepped foot inside of one for that first time. And now I was curious what else I was wrong about. I learned how to interrogate everything. And to this day, I challenge all of my assumptions and I'm no, I'm no longer afraid to be wrong. Um, all these pieces of myself that were hard and rough, uh, the information that I was now taking in sloughed off all of those rough edges. I learned critical thinking skills 
I didn't even know what critical thinking skills were beforehand, but my perspectives changed as I learned. And, and that's the, the magical thing that happened. Um, it's very challenging to get information inside of a prison, but I spent two to three additional hours every day in the computer lab. I developed this intense interest in all things Oscar Wilde. Professors, librarians, the BARD uh, site director brought me tens of thousands of pages of research about all aspects of the lifetime clothes and shenanigans about Oscar. And uh, I still have every shred of paper <laughs> of research I accumulated. That's how valuable this information was to me. Uh, there's something very profound about reading De Profundis while in prison, uh, reading multiple interpretations of it. The, um, oh, he's so whiny, he's just a foolish man pining for a boy, or, oh, this is his, uh, his repentance, he's atoning for, for, for his sins with his maker, but when I had that context, all of that information that had been made available to me, I actually was thinking, no, these critics don't get it. He's not a foolish man pining. He's not, he's not being apologetic. He's unapologetic. He's defiant. And these are passages with the same lyrical quality as the sarcasm in the Ballad of Reading Jail. And those who have not endeavored to understand the full context see cowardice in those passages, a litany of mea culpas, but actually it is the wit and wisdom of a man at his lowest who refuses to bend to the convention of his times. And I never thought I would be challenging assumptions about literature. Um, the ability to access information changes how I feel about information now that I'm home and a productive member of society. I don't fall for tired tropes. I check out sources. I decide, I get to decide if I believe what I'm reading is true. And I can throw out things that don't resonate and I can, can choose. That's the point. I learned how to choose what information is valuable when it's set in front of me. So I've done time, a lot of time, <laughs> without access to much more than the escapism of, of a vampire novel or, or a whole bunch of James Patterson. But the educators who invested their time and talent in polishing, in polishing me couldn't have succeeded without the support of the academic librarians at the main campus. And whenever an outside request to a community library was fulfilled by the prison librarian, I knew I had five days to read it take notes, absorb the contents before the book would be released back into the community, though I had to stay. I revered those moments knowing someone, a free person, had touched these words. And I would wonder if those words touched them and nourished them, a free person, the same way I was devouring them, gorging on them really, as a prisoner, uh, because I knew that these words would have to sustain me until the next batch of books would come. This is how I rediscovered my humanity and how I was able to now recognize it in others. So it really is a privilege to spend time with you all. You're my light bringers. You're working to preserve and dispense knowledge into darkest places where few dare to glance, let alone tread. The education I received while in prison, both formally and informally, really freed me. And I couldn't have done it without the librarians. And when I snatch my degree from Leo Botstein in a few months, trust and believe it's your achievement too. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey, for sharing your experiences with what it is like to get access to knowledge inside and how important it really is. Um, my pen pal, Patricia Pruitt, who's been incarcerated for most of her life at this point in Missouri, um, she's currently trying to get out. Um, we just started college about two years ago. And one of the things that she shared with me is that this is the only life goal that she's had the entire time that she's been incarcerated. Um, and it's so incredibly profoundly meaningful, as you've shared, to have access to education and to the resources that support learning and being in the world. Um, 
and finding your place within it. So thank you again for that. And I'm very, very excited to hear from the librarians who are with us today about the work that they're doing. We'll start with a presentation from Amy Brunson, who works at Mount Tam College. I'm Amy Brunson. I'm the Director of Library Services and Educational Technology at Mount Hamill Pius College. And I'll start by explaining who we are and what we do. Um, and really the best way to explain that is through our mission statement. So the mission of Mount Tamil Pius College is to provide an intellectually rigorous, inclusive associate of arts degree program and college preparatory program free of charge to people at San Quentin State Prison to expand access to uh, quality higher education for incarcerated people and to foster the values of equity, civic engagement, independence of thought and freedom of expression. So in short, we're a privately funded community college inside San Quentin State Prison, which is located in the Bay Area, just north of San Francisco. All of our students are working toward Associate of Arts degrees 100% tuition free. So for a little backstory, um, we uh, began operating as a fully volunteer run extension site of Patton University in 1996. Um, Patton University was located in Oakland. And then in 20, or 2003, sorry, we became a nonprofit and adopted the name Prison University Project. But we still operated under the umbrella of Patton University until they closed their doors in 2018, which is when we started the process of gaining independent accredit accreditation as a community college. So the accreditation process is very long and rigorous. And over the next several years, we built up the infrastructure needed to support ourselves as an independent college. And this brought up the need for library services and technology to the forefront. Um, in 2020, we changed our name to Mount Tamil Pius College, or MTC for short. And then finally, in 2022, we were granted initial accreditation as an independent community college, and that's where we stand today. Um, we have about 30 staff members now, and our program relies heavily on volunteer faculty. And luckily, there are so many amazing colleges and universities in the Bay Area with instructors and grad students who volunteer their time um, to teach and tutor our students. This is a view over the lower yard of San Quentin, and in the background you can see Mount Tamil Pius, which is um, what we're named after. So I want to give a snapshot of our patron population. Um, this is where our patron population stands for the spring 2023 20, academic term. So our students make up the bulk of our patron base. Um, we have 527 total students this semester. This includes students who are actively enrolled in courses and those who might be taking a break from classes but plan to continue their education with us. We also serve our graduates who are still at San Quentin. Um, they are eligible to continue to take additional classes and extracurriculars with us if they choose. Faculty and staff um, also interact with the library occasionally and some use our laptops and receive support for that as well. So like I mentioned, we have about 30 staff members and this semester we have 136 volunteer faculty. I've also listed um, prospective patrons here with waitlisted students and active paroled alumni, meaning alumni who have paroled but are still in contact with us. These are two groups that we're always looking for more ways to connect with and support, so they will likely become library patrons in some form or another in the future. And we do get questions about how the restoration of Pell Grants for incarcerated people is going to affect us. Um, our students attend MTC for free and we don't plan to change that. So Pell likely won't affect the makeup of our student body very much, um, but I do hope that it will provide opportunities for some of the prospective students who may have otherwise had to sit on our waitlist for a long time, get into a different college program sooner if they choose. A little more about our students. Um, any person incarcerated at San Quentin with a high school diploma or GED is eligible to enroll. The current age range of our student body right now is 23 to 82. Uh, with a mean age of 51.6. So our student body is very ethnically diverse. Um, we do operate in a men's facility, but we have students who do not identify as male, so there's some gender diversity as well. Um, and we have a handful of deaf and hard of hearing students, some of which require ASL interpretive services, um, which the prison provides. Our students also have a really wide range of educational backgrounds, everywhere from, you know, recently receiving a GED to having multiple college degrees already under their belt. This is our graduating class of 2021 and 2022. Um, this is the first commencement we've been able to have since 2019 due to COVID. So it was a very special day. 
So a little about my role. Um, I started my role in April 2022. I'm currently a one person department kind of laying the groundwork for the library services and technology access that are really essential for any college to have. So I'll start with the library side of things and then move on to technology, um, but much of those two areas are, are very intertwined. So one current priority is establishing a library management system. We have a small library space in San Quentin with about 8,000 volumes, and we also have some overflow space in our off-campus office. Most of our books are textbooks or other assigned reading for courses. Um, the collection is not digitally cataloged, so up until now, all library indexing has been done by hand by student volunteers, and it's really hard for anyone to figure out if we have something that they're looking for. Um, I recently acquired a web-based library management system through Alexandria ILS, and I'm in the beginning processes of customizing that system and cataloging the collection, um, which is challenging due to, you know, for one, the amount of time it takes, and also because I've never really been on the back end of library work like this. So I'm just kind of figuring it out. Um, I'm also working to expand our collection and build a digital one. So right now I'm purchasing books kind of as needed when we get requests from students and faculties, um, students and faculty. And then San Quentin has its own institutional library, which is much bigger than ours. So I can refer students there if they're looking for something that the San Quentin library already has. Um, while I'm in the process of, oops, sorry. While I'm in the process of cataloging our collection, I'll be working with our academic directors and faculty to identify gaps so that our collection can better support our curriculum and our students' interests. And then building a digital collection is something that we've made baby steps on. Um, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabil Rehabilitation, or CDCR, recently acquired an EBSCO license. So our students now have access to a research database from inside the prison for the first time ever, which is very, very exciting. Um, I'm also in the process of getting students access to JSTOR with Stacy's help. Thank you, Stacy. Um, as well as Bookshare, where we'll have accessible ebooks for students with reading barriers. So once those sites are approved, I'll continue working to build a more comprehensive collection of ebooks and research resources. And the major challenge here is just the time that it takes to get websites approved, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide. Um, currently, we don't have any formal library policies or procedures. Um, a collection development policy is really important for any library to have, but I think for us it's significant because it will help us defend possible challenges from CDCR when it comes to the content that we provide in our collection. And then as for circulation policies, um, right now students just check out materials by filling out written checkout forms. There are no due dates or fines or rules about how many materials a student can check out. So as a tuition-free college, we also have a fine-free library, which is not going to change. Um, but it's important for us to have rules that we can point to in case San Quentin challenges a student about the materials they have checked out. We really want to have clear policies that protect our students. Part of my job is also advocating for student access to traditional library resources. So to give a couple of examples, um, just getting access to materials in a timely manner. It can take a really long time to get books inside. Every book has to be approved by prison staff, and we've had requests go unanswered for months at times. So I hope to establish a more streamlined process that allows us to bring library materials in much more quickly without as much red tape. And we also need to hire another librarian or library assistant. Um, currently, we don't have things like open library hours, in-person reference help, or the ability for students to place holds. And these things are all really important, but they require much more time than I can give currently. So I'm advocating within MTC to hire someone, and we're also working with CDCR to create an incarcerated library clerk position. I'm also working to build external library partnerships. Um, because we're a very small and newly in independent school, we don't have access to resources through a larger university. So one of my priorities is getting connected with other colleges and public libraries in the Bay Area to provide our students access to a wider net of resources. So moving on to oops, the tech side of things, <laughs> um, running the MTC Computer Lab. Last year, we secured an agreement with CDCR to bring in laptops for students. This happened just before I arrived. Uh, my boss and coworkers worked with a technology consultant to get this done. And from what I understand, it involved a lot of meetings with CDCR at the state and the institutional level. So MTC purchases the laptops, but technically we donate them to San Quentin when we send them into the prison. CDCR has a contracted IT company in charge of imaging the laptops and making sure that they meet all the prison security requirements. 
So we started with 35 laptops and opened our computer lab in March of 2022. This semester, the lab is open for eight two-hour sessions every week, and each session is staffed by one outside volunteer and two student volunteers who I recruit and train um, each semester as needed. The laptops are fairly limited in what they can um, access, but students do have Microsoft Office Suite and Google Chrome browsers, and the internet is um, mediated and only a handful of websites can be accessed, and I'll talk a little more about that later. So I'm working to provide computer literacy learning opportunities for students. Um, aside from working independently in the lab, students can register for computer skills workshops. So we're currently offering workshops in Laptop Basics, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. And each time a new resource is made available, like EBSCO, for example, I'll try to visit classes and create written guides and offer workshops to instruct students in how to use it. Um, since starting computer workshops this past summer, 112 students have attended at least one workshop. Integrating online learning into MTC courses is a huge priority as well. CDCR has a contract with Canvas Learning Management System, so we have access to Canvas through the prison. Um, Canvas allows instructors to upload course material, assignments, and discussion topics, which students can view and interact with. Uh, it's been challenging introducing Canvas to our courses for several reasons. One is that many students don't have much computer experience, so there's a learning curve there. Um, CDCR only has a limited number of student accounts to offer us, and communication with CDCR is often really disjointed, and setting up a course involves a ton of back and forth between me, the, our instructors, and the CDCR Canvas administrators. <laughs> um, right now we have two classes using Canvas, and we plan to grow this number each semester. Identifying and addressing technical issues is also something that takes up a lot of time and energy. Um, there are a lot of technical issues that arise when using laptops at San Quentin. Um, I don't have time to get into the specifics of them here, but I will say that probably the most challenging thing about it is that I don't have administrator privileges for our computers. So anything above like very rudimentary troubleshooting has to go through the San Quentin IT team, who you can imagine have a lot on their plate already. And then broadly, I'm working with and around CDCR to expand technology access for students. So just a couple of additional points here. Um, the technology agreement that we reached with CDCR last year allows for us to check laptops out to students for them to keep with them and take to housing or anywhere else in the facility. And this is something that we've just recently been able to do because we were able to purchase an additional 115 laptops. Um, but getting those in working order and distributing them involves a lot of communication and time. And then I briefly mentioned earlier that students can access a mediated version of the internet. So right now there's only a handful of websites that our students can access. So I'm always looking for additional websites and digital resources to supplement our curriculum and help students develop their technology skills. But the process for getting them approved is really opaque. Um, I communicate with some folks at the state level of CDCR to request additional websites and programs, and it takes about six months for them to be approved or denied. And then it may take another month or so for the new resource to be up and running on our laptops. So looking ahead, I just want to kind of end on a hopeful note with a quote from one of our students who's also a computer lab assistant. He says, the opportunity to spend time learning new technology empowers me to hope bigger and work harder. It is my strongest belief that having computer access and even limited internet access allows me to realize how society functions while professionally preparing myself for work relationships. This gives me hope that MTC can have the opportunity to change the tra trajectory of more lives while empowering this community to learn and grow with technology. So I just think these sentiments are really well put and I have the same hopes for the impact that my department um, can make on our students. This is um, a photo of some of our alumni. So many of our students do go on to pursue bachelor's degrees or other further education after they graduate with us, whether it's through correspondence courses from prison or attending a four-year college in person after their release. Um, this group of alumni was taken at our holiday party in December, and several of these guys are now actually full-time staff members at MTC. Thank you very much. My email is on this slide if you want to connect, um, and you can check out mounttamcollege.edu if you want to learn more about our school. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Josh Hahn, and I'm here to talk about the NPEP Library, Northwestern Prison Education Program Library at Northwestern University Libraries. 
Uh, as I said, my name is Josh Hahn. I'm the humanities and prison education librarian at Northwestern University Libraries. I'm also the liaison to many different departments in the humanities. Um, and as of spring 2021, I've started working um, in the prison education area and helping to support the Northwestern Prison Education Program. Um, through this presentation, I'll be able to tell you a little bit about Northwestern, the prison education program, how we started um, the library support system, um, what that entails um, in, in a little bit of detail. Um, and then I'll share some other easy ways I think that folks can get in, um, involved in this kind of work. So for folks who are not, um, who don't know about Northwestern University or have never heard of Northwestern University before, um, is in Evanston, Illinois, uh, just north of Chicago, and it sits on the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, uh, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Adawa, um, and is still home to vibrant uh, Native communities and um, movements as well. Uh, it's a private institution, it's part of the Big Ten Academic Alliance, um, and also has campuses in Chicago and uh, Doha, Qatar. Um, we're a tier one research university with 8,000 undergraduate students and 14,000 graduate students. And um, the collaboration I'll be talking about today and the prisons that we're teaching and working in um, are up to three and a half hours away from, from where we're located. So these are not facilities um, near the campus. Um, and so before I get started on, on this, I just want to say that due to the illogics of carcerality, it's important that we are careful and committed with the language we use to describe those most affected by the prison industrial complex. This is something I stress in all the training we do um, for this work. Um, in this presentation, I'll be using the terms incarcerated persons and incarcerated students instead of the dehumanizing language of the state, which often uses terms such as prisoner, convict, felon, etc. Um, and while at times I will be using the gender binary terms that the Department of Corrections uses to classify and differentiate between men's and women's institutions, I want to acknowledge the existence and lived realities of trans, queer, two-spirit, and non-binary folks who are disproportionately affected by the prison industrial complex and state violence. Um, and if folks are interested in learning more about language, I really recommend the Underground Scholars Initiatives Language Guide, linked on the left and on the bottom right, the language project from the Marshall Project, which um, has really amazing essays by incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people thinking and talking about language. So the Northwestern Prison Education um, Program is a partnership between Oakton Community College um, and currently enrolls 80 incarcerated students uh, working towards their associates and bachelor's degrees in a general liberal studies um, degree that includes courses in the humanities, sciences, social sciences, and more. Um, so through Oakland Community College, they receive their associate's degrees, and through Northwestern, they receive their bachelor's degrees. Uh, if you're interested in more about NPEP, which I'll talk about a little bit more throughout this presentation, there's a website link just below. Whoops, I did not want to play that. Um, Northwestern Prison Education Program uh, currently is in two prison facilities right now. Uh, the first one is Stateville Correctional Facility, which is um, where we have three cohorts of 20 men each. Um, two of them have received their bachelor's degrees, and I'll talk about that, in, or their associate's degrees, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the men's facility is a mostly maximum security uh, facility. But to demystify that a little bit, obviously, like a lot of things in carceral settings, some of these rules and things are very arbitrary. Um, while the men here have limited movement and limited time to access resources, um, and it's also sometimes a little bit harder for us to get in and out and to get things in and out of the prison, um, I don't want to, you know, participate in any kind of fear mongering around like what a maximum facility, uh, maximum security facility is. Um, Logan Correctional Center is our is a women's facility that we're in. Um, it's a multi-level security. We have a, one single cohort of 20 students, um, and this facility is a lot easier for us to get information in and out, um, and there's very just different, different reasons for that, which we can talk about um, off camera. Um, at NPEP, um, it's a very small staff of three people, so a director, assistant director, um, and a education coordinator. Um, and like a lot of programs that we'll probably be talking about today, um, this involves a ton of volunteer labor. Um, so undergraduate students, graduate students, um, and instructors. And I want to acknowledge that labor um, first and foremost. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. 
So the NPEP students, like I said, there's three cohorts in the men's prison and one cohort in the women's prison. This is a picture of our first cohort receiving their associate's degree. And we now have two cohorts that have, have accomplished their associate's degree. Um, and that means two cohorts that are now on to working towards their bachelor's at Northwestern. Um, they're all working towards a general studies degree. Um, most of our students are serving long-term sentences and the ages vary um, from uh, 20s to 60s and 70s. Um, and I want to also say that NPEP, along with being an educational um, focused mission, also provides access to wellness services to our students and transformative justice um, resources. And so we have a very holistic approach to this, which I really like. Um, and that also includes tutors for academic purposes, tutors for writing purposes, and also tutor um, librarian support, which we'll talk about. Um, I really encourage you to visit the link in the bottom left here to learn more about our students. A lot of them are doing amazing work that's getting published on the outside, um, and it'd be great for you to find out more about them and, and the kinds of work they're doing. So before the library collaboration with NPEP began in spring of 2021, I had been noticing how Northwestern kept referring to NPEP students as our students. And I was curious and a bit suspicious about what kinds of access incarcerated students had compared to students on campus and wanted to be sure the library was doing everything it could to include NPEP students. This led to the creation of the NPEP library, a service I coordinate, but which is supported by dozens of library workers across Northwestern University libraries. This is mostly manifested in supporting the research needs and interests of MPEP students through creating new processes to facilitate research consultations with a student population who have no access to the internet and limited access to outdated and underfunded prison libraries. The bulk of what we do is indebted to and building on the work of library colleagues at Jackson College in Michigan and their support um, of the Jackson College Corrections Education Program. The MPEP library began offering reference services to MPEP students by way of the research request form pictured here on the left. While all forms are transactional in nature, we tried our best to create space for student agency to tell us about their assignment in their own words, select the types of resources most, most helpful to them, um, and uh, some light guidance on crafting a research question. Um, and of course, lots of space for sharing anything from comments to actual individual citations. Students have access to this form um, every quarter for every class. Um, they can fill it out during class time or study hall or on their own time. Um, it is um, gathered up by a tutor or myself or an instructor during study hall each week and then taken back to NPEP and scanned. And then we, we take them and process them. And what we, what we return is very important. We return a letter from the library addressing any kind of questions they had, providing context, um, information literacy moments, and inviting always inviting any kind of follow-up correspondence. We also always provide a copy of the form they submitted back to them because this is something that they can't really like file away. They don't have um, an email saved with what they asked for. So I think it's always very important to, to return that to them as well. Um, and we can provide up to 100 or around 100 pages of resources such as news stories, scholarly articles, encyclopedia entries, works of art, poems, et cetera, et cetera, anything relevant to their work. But we try, because they don't have access to the internet, to do a very broad range of things, whether that's in a Wikipedia and encyclopedia entries, right, the first pass kind of information that we take for granted when we're learning a new topic, to scholarly articles. So they really do um, get a range of materials as, as best we can. The process and training, I just described a little bit about how the process works. Um, it's very manual, um, very labor intensive in a lot of ways and includes a lot of processing and scanning and a lot of paper, a lot of printing. Um, uh, but uh, within the library every quarter, depending on which kinds of classes are being taught, I will um, reach out to all the subject librarians for those classes do a quick training session um, just to orient them to the work and uh, offer any space for questions and things they might be concerned about. Um, and then I am able to attend study halls as I can um, to get time with the students to work with them to talk with about things around information literacy, uh, library resources, and, and things like that. But um, currently librarians, including myself, access to students is very, very limited and usually happens within like maybe um, 
a couple of minutes on a break during a class or um, during a study hall when I can only talk to so many people within a single like three hour stretch. There are some issues that come up with this kind of work when you're when you're sending in hundreds of thousands of pages every year. Um, one of them is censorship and self-censorship. So for censorship, these are a couple of things that have not gotten through. Um, the first one is in the belly zine, which is an abolitionist journal um, that the Department of Corrections considers as an organizing, a tool for organizing within in the prison. Um, that's not to say that we don't get abolitionist stuff in a lot. We do, um, as long as it's related to the course, but there are certain things on their list that um, we definitely can't get through. Um, another heavy problem uh, for us is for the Department of Corrections, every image of a person, they need to be dressed appropriately to visit the prison. Um, and so a picture of a ballerina bearing her shoulders will not get through. Um, and so sometimes this can lead to uh, what we call self-censorship, right? Where for once or one time I had a student who requested a bunch of artwork by a particular artist, and I had to actually redact some of the artwork um, in order to get the other pieces in. Um, it's the least joyful thing a librarian can possibly do, I would assume, um, but it's something that we have to do because in a lot of ways we are um, there at the discretion of the Department of Corrections. And so I try to make the Department of Corrections uh, make those decisions for us instead of self-censoring, but there are certain things we just know we can't get through um, and it's not worth jeopardizing the entire program uh, most times. Uh, there's also lots of lockdowns and delays. So doing this kind of work, you need a lot of patience and flexibility. Instructors need to offer um, uh, like very um, flexible due dates for things. And we have to be reactive each week to different kinds of delays in this work. It's not very seamless. It's not very much the same thing every week. And that's just something built in. Uh, it's often hard to build relationships with students. Like I said, we don't get a lot of time to have back and forth with them to really do the kinds of research consultations that librarians are known for and enjoy doing. Um, and so sometimes that can be a very hard, hard thing to handle and the work kind of feels transactional. The workload can be kind of heavy sometimes. I think that's the least of our issues. Um, everyone that has worked with on this at the library is very happy to do it and make space for it. Um, and sometimes we just don't always get it right. Um, it's not easy to hear back from the students, but sometimes we hear back from them that we didn't find the right kinds of resources and or we're misunderstanding each other's interests. Um, and so those can be the kinds of hard things. And um, it's easy to get down on yourself. But what I tell all the librarians and library workers here is that this is not us. This is this is a system. And these are some of the things that we have to um, deal with. So the response um, and impact for the students is overwhelmingly positive. Uh, they love access to librarians and library resources, and they share that often with us. Um, students definitely feel a deeper sense of autonomy in the research projects and interests that they're doing. I think this echoes very much what Stacy was saying earlier. Students feel a stronger connection to the outside world and scholarly community. Um, and so this the impact on students is great. Um, they often are very interested in libraries and librarianship after this, um, which is fantastic to hear. It's also great for librarians because it's an opportunity to uh, build connections with faculty who are teaching these classes. Every class that NPEP teaches is also taught on campus. Um, and so it's a great way to um, uh, access and, and collaborate with more professors as well. Um, student tutors who support this work often need research support. So we're oftentimes working with undergraduates and graduate students as well. Um, and it helps with um, the increasing scholarship in carceral studies as well. While the reference work that we do is the main component, um, we're trying to leverage that to expand uh, many of our services to incarcerated students. Um, so we've worked with NU Press to do publishing support for their work. Uh, we do an annual summer book drive. Um, we help students build and write book reviews for the Freedom Reads Library. Um, we've purchased subscriptions so our collections have, have taken a change. So we've purchased subscriptions to Prison Legal News, provided financial support to JSTOR's American Prison Newspaper. We've also created a social justice fund to collect in prison education and social justice issues more broadly. Um, and in the future, we're hoping to build critical information literacy booklet for incarcerated students that they can keep in their cells and always reference. A lot of the work we do now is just loose leaf paper that gets lost and is hard to keep track of. So having a, a information literacy and how to do research 101 booklet for them to keep um, and refer back to will be huge. Um, and we're also hoping to teach an information literacy mini course 
at Cook County Jail. So lots of things on the horizon. And I think what you want to do is get your foot in the door and then expand these services as much as possible as you can. And the last thing I just want to say, I want to make a pitch for the much maligned lab guides. Um, most prison education programs are made up of volunteer labor, labor, folks new to this work and have little time and space to provide context, training, and other kinds of support. Creating a guide and curating literature and resources is a lightweight but deeply useful way to support a prison education program. And this guide has been found useful for everyone from instructors teaching in prison for the first time to students working in carceral studies. It's also an easy and important way to highlight alternatives to the prison industrial complex and to center voices of incarcerated people. So even if you can't get in the prisons um, and do the kind of reference work that we've been able to do, I think there are other ways of supporting programs on, on your campus. So that's all from me. I thank you very much. And uh, my email is there if anyone wants to write with questions, comments, concerns, and thank you for your time. Hello, and thanks so much for allowing me to talk with you today about providing academic library services in a prison setting. My name is Rebecca Bott, and I'm the Community Library Co-Coordinator for the Education Justice Project, the University of Illinois' College and Prison Program at Danville Correctional Center, a medium security men's prison in Danville, Illinois. My co-coordinator and I's main responsibility is to lead our team of EJP student librarians in providing library services for our community. Together, we provide reference support, set collection development policy, catalog materials, provide programming, and do everything that is typical for a small academic library. EJP has about 65 students taking upper level four credit college courses, and they make up the main, our main patron base. We also serve what we call EJP affiliates, members of the general population who are not currently enrolled in four credit courses but do participate in EJP, EJP's extracurricular programs, such as Language Partners, which is our English as a Second Language program, or CAVE, which is our uh, Community Anti-Violence Education. We are able to, to provide a 4,000 volume circulating academic collection out at the prison. Mm -hmm. so, sorry. We have a computer lab, but no internet, and are just now able to bring in the offsite JSTOR database. Because our on-site collection is so small, we supplement by offering offsite reference support. Students can fill out a reference request form that walks them through the reference interview process, and an EJP library intern, normally a second year library student, provides appropriate materials from the University of Illinois Library. We're allowed to send in books from the university's print collection or print off relevant articles. These are compiled into a packet that students can pick up then at the library when they're ready. Students are also able to submit book and article requests and to suggest, make suggestions for the library's permanent collection. All of our materials have to go through a lengthy prison clearance process and there's never any guarantee that they'll be cleared. In addition to providing materials, we also provide bibliographic instruction, teaching students effective research strategies and how to get the most out of the collection we have. This is an area of growth for us, and we're looking forward to teaching JSTOR over the summer and fall semester and evaluating these early efforts and seeing how we can improve. We also provide library programming, like poetry readings, author talks, and summer reading programs to help continue thoughtful discussion outside the classroom. One of our ongoing library projects is improving our information organization in the prison library. A lot of the conversations around providing library services in prisons focus on, focuses on access to information and all the problems that come with trying to get information into a prison. But once you get the material in the door, how do you make it easy to find and to use? For us, our library catalog is the starting point. Several of our student librarians are also skilled programmers and they were able to build a database in Python. In addition to the basic author, title, publisher information, we were able to include some extra fields to make items more searchable. For example, we were able to add alternative title searches so that students who look up Lord of the Rings can still find Fellowship of the Ring, for example. We are also able to add subject headings, which allow students to search more clearly by topic. Students can check books out and back in using the database, and it automatically clears circulation records, though not circulation statistics, once the book is returned. Because we have a library catalog, we also have call numbers, which is an easy task on the outside, but a very challenging one to do on the inside when you don't have the internet. Our student librarians are good at what they do, but it's time consuming and difficult. 
we're starting to bring books in already partially cataloged to streamline this part of the work. To make materials easier to find, we often use Library of Congress subject headings, which are set and standardized descriptors that are used by libraries across the country. In addition to those, we use natural language subject headings. In this context, that means that we use terms that we think our community would think to use when looking for a book. So perhaps they're looking for a book on budgeting and they would use the search term finances instead of personal finance. In other instances, we add or substitute search terms because the Library of Congress is too slow in replacing subject headings that are either offensive or outdated and really need to be retired. As a community, we try to be careful about the words we use and we want our cataloging to reflect that value. Creating course reserves is another important part of our work in an area where we want to improve. We're a general academic library and our goal is to be able to get students started in their research on almost any topic. However, as much as we'd like to, we simply don't have the space to permanently provide all the materials necessary to provide, to support the wide variety of upper level courses EJP offers. Our current answer to this is course reserves. We are able to check books out from the university to supplement our own collection for the semester, adding breadth and depth we need to make the library, to help the library keep up with our students' work and curiosity. It can easily take six weeks or much longer to get an item through clearance. So we have to anticipate the questions students might ask or the different directions their research might take them well in advance of them thinking to ask. We're a very small library and depend on ongoing support and collaborations with other libraries and groups. The main one for us is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign Library. Despite being on campus, uh, none of the librarians that are part of EJP are University of Illinois staff or library staff. Um, and so while they do not provide library services, they do provide access to library materials. Uh, we also have and continue to build strong relationships with some of the subject specialists on campus who are able to help us when we need extra support for complicated reference questions. Another collaborator and supporter has been JSTOR Labs, who is providing us with our one offline database, which is going to be an incredible addition to our library. We're so excited that this will allow students to do, play a bigger role in their own research process. Uh, Reginald Dwayne Betts and the wonderful team, uh, Freedom Reads team at Yale provide us with several copies of a new book every single month, which facilitates programming and just helps us get more books into the prison. And an ongoing support has been the growing group of formal and informal support in this space among colleagues. It used to feel like nobody else did this work and you were constantly reinventing the wheel. That is no longer the case and it's a joy to be able to talk, plan, and collaborate with like-minded colleagues. For all the fun that this, I think this work provides, there are ongoing issues. Um, one of them that has been a biggest challenge and continues to shape our library is censorship. In January of 2019, the prison administration seized around 200 of our library books, all of which had already been through clearance and most of which had to do with race and struggle, re-entry, gender and sexuality, et cetera. Some examples include Cornell West's Race Matters and Visiting Day, a children's book about visiting a parent in prison. The administration deemed these books as subject matter divisive and we were forced to take them off prison property. The materials were ultimately returned, but while the situation was shocking, it wasn't unusual. There have been times when we've been asked to tear pages out of books or readers and other times when we've submitted books for clearance that didn't make it through. It can be difficult to build a thoughtful, rigorous academic collection in this setting. And there isn't always one way to navigate this issue. A right response today could be the wrong response tomorrow. And all responses have to be weighed against the good of the overall program. Another issue that we have is space. While we have designated rooms in the education wing, all of these spaces are multi-use and our library is also a computer lab and a classroom. The goal is to have warm, inviting spaces where students can be comfortable studying, flipping through a magazine in a cozy reading chair, or working collaboratively with their colleagues, while still having as many library resources as possible. This is a difficult balance already, but one should also be prepared to lose space if there's a shift in institutional priorities, or if a new program joins and they need space of their own. 
we recently went from three packed rooms to two overflowing rooms. And that has required us to be flexible and to start thinking about how we can be more adaptable, finding creative ways to use the space we have, perhaps shifting to more e-resources to continue to grow in ways that don't require shelving. Despite the struggles in this work, there's so much to do and so much to be excited about. One of the areas of interest for me, and I know a lot of my the other practitioners in the field, is how to better prepare students for using college libraries after release. Many of our students are released from prison and start college on the outside, sometimes even within, within months. And they're coming into college not as freshmen, but as juniors, seniors, and sometimes even graduate students. Most of our students have been incarcerated for over 10 years, a lot of them 20 or more, and the technology they're expected to effortlessly use now didn't exist then. There's a gaping chasm between the tiny prison library we're able to provide for them and the full research university collection. And currently there's almost no support that helps students bridge that gap. Our alumni have suggested that in an ideal world, academic librarians would train formerly incarcerated students as peer mentors. Learning technology as a returning citizen isn't just practical, it's also emotional. It requires a lot of vulnerability to admit that you've never Googled something or that you were doing really well converting a PDF on your phone, but then got attacked by your weather app and you didn't know how to get out. Until we can build these kinds of peer programs, it's important that we raise awareness with other colleagues working on the outside. With the restoration of Pell Grants, there will be more, more students than ever who are in this position. And I hope we can work together to create libraries that are safe and supportive for our returning scholars. Along with new students that we'll have with the restoration of Pell, there'll also be new librarians doing this work. Sometimes they'll be joining the field because they're passionate about prison librarianship and higher education in prison. And sometimes they'll be joining the field because setting up a library in a prison has been dumped on their already full desk and they're starting from nothing. In either case, I'm really excited to get to work and learn with them and hope that everyone who is new to this work would like to talk or collaborate or just be heard would please reach out at any time. So thank you so much for joining us today. And the, if you'd like to learn more about EJP, there's um, information there and mine is at the beginning of this talk. Thanks so much. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Rayanne Montague and I am very pleased to be part of this uh, presentation. Uh, it's talking about academic library services and incarceration. Um, I am uh, I work with Chicago State University as a professor in the Library and Information Science program. So uh, my perspective and my focus for um, this part of the discussion is a little bit different uh, because it's not related specifically with uh, one facility or or one. Uh, educational initiative. Um, I'm actually mostly going to be talking about uh, a project that I have been leading called the Information Justice Institute, which is a uh, part of a, a planning project uh, that is uh, focused on considering um, those individuals who are incarcerated and recently released and their networks of support and library services um, including academic library services for them. Um, and this is a photo of, of some of the project team. Uh, as some of you may know, Chicago State University um, is uh, located on the south side of Chicago. And when we were looking at developing this project, we were seeing how it might align with some of the mission and strategic plan of the university, which is, I think, for everyone, a good place to, to consider starting uh, when you're looking at possibly expanding your library services to reach out uh, to facilities. Um, that, that alignment will, will enable, enable um, new opportunities. As well, within the project, we have been uh, engaging in a lot of different conversations and um, asking critical questions. Um, and so for example, we're looking at things like uh, who, who is represented in different um, situations and who is not, and looking at um, the uh, consequences of punishment and how these consequences extend uh, across time and space and different situations. And um, so, for example, for us uh, at the university, 
on campus, uh, are we being uh, welcoming? Are we providing services related to um, helping with reentry with a little bit that was discussed in, in the last presentation? When we step back and look at the situation, one of the models that we might consider is thinking about the different worlds and as academics or as uh, practitioners thinking about how we are crossing these boundaries. So um, going back to examples in Illinois, which, which I am most familiar with looking just to begin at the spaces where these different facilities are located. And you can see sort of a cluster up in that Northeast corner um, for higher ed institutions around Chicagoland. And then looking at, for example, in this case, um, state correctional facilities with red dots that are distributed all across the state. And just thinking about um, the time uh, it takes to, to get to different facilities and connections. And, and this has come up when folks in, in the recent discussions were talking about, you know, this, this facility is three hours away or, um, and, and as well, the challenges that come with, well, it's not like, it's not like we can just um, have great internet access between these groups trying to uh, come together because that is also not a, a possibility. So, so there are lots of challenges related to uh, the distribution, the logistics, um, the, uh, the access. Uh, the, the last speaker talked about challenges with censorship, uh, the building of trust. And so all these different issues are embedded in a complex set of social realities. And, and these are the kinds of, of issues that we've been grappling with in the IJI project. Uh, one other theme that I want to um, talk about before I talk a little bit more about our research in particular um, is that we have definitely um, found it's been very important to consider collaboration and of course to, uh, to base what we're doing on a user perspective. So, um, IJI, our, our project involves uh, LIS students and faculty, uh, librarians from our library, the Gwendolyn Brooks Library, plus community partners who um, are coming, in our case, um, representing folks who were formerly incarcerated. And the, the two groups that we've been working with most, the um, ECCSC and a weigh in uh, information about them is, is here. Um, now, I said I wanted to talk a little bit about the survey results. So um, in 2021, we conducted a, a national survey to um, try to understand a bit more about librarians' experience with uh, working, either uh, offering services to folks who are incarcerated or those who are recently released. Now, this was not um, set up specifically for academic librarians, but um, this is the subset of folks who responded uh, with academic library backgrounds. So it's a, this is a small subset of the, of the group, uh, but still I think this initial data does provide some valuable insights. So when we asked academic librarians if the library they're affiliated with offered programs or services to support individuals who are currently incarcerated, the majority said no. Uh, those who said yes, um, shared some of the kinds of services that they are offering um, and also shared a little bit of like their insights in terms of, um, you know, if they, if they thought that folks were doing this uh, in, a, in a vibrant way, uh, in a robust way. We also asked um, if the library they're affiliated with, so in this case, again, the academic librarians, uh, we're supporting individuals who were recently incarcerated, so who, who are in the reentry phase. Um, again, the, the majority um, said no, and then the others were not sure. So I think that in itself is a bit telling. Uh, it certainly indicates that there hasn't been a lot of consideration of serving this potential population. Um, and even some of the comments um, 
that I think this falls outside the scope of academic libraries. That sort of implies that there um, is not a connection uh, when you know we've we've already seen there can be incredible connections. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, uh, in terms of alignment with strategic goals, mission, vision of the individual institution, if it, this is not seen as part of the mission, that certainly um, would create a gap. Um, and then again, you know there. There may be, perhaps there's a mention, but there, it's not uh, not an action that we see. So um, to do it to look good is not uh, really a, a, a great um, strategy. What would you like to see uh, in terms of offering additional library programs or services based on the academic library context. So folks were being very candid in the survey and, and said, you know, one person said, there's nothing, nothing I'd like to see. Uh, then there are some examples of different kinds of services. Uh, again, a telling comment, uh, support for folks who were recently incarcerated, now that you mention it. So it's, it's not something that, um, that was on their radar or on their mind before uh, this survey went out to uh, ask librarians about their insights related to these topics. Uh, and again, some some different examples that are up here on the on the screen: online publishing, lectures, story time. Uh, you know, really, really, the sky's the limit. Uh, in terms of what might happen uh, from uh, all kinds of different perspectives in the library world. When uh, the question about offering uh, library programs and our services, is this something that you learned about? So we asked folks if they had learned about this uh, when they were doing their LIS uh, education, their, their MS LIS programs. And within the academic library context, the response was 80% no. So this, this wasn't on their radar from their, uh, the institution where they were affiliated, and it hadn't been on their radar, radar previously uh, through studies. So for me, as an LAS educator, uh, you know, this is a call. Uh, this, is a, this is kind of a big warning uh, that uh, we're really missing out here on, on considering some kinds of services that are important and valuable and uh, maybe helps to understand why there are so many gaps and inconsistencies. Uh, and I should also mention related to this that this uh, was not this was universal. So this 80 percent uh, of not having uh, thought about this in the context of LIS education was across all the respondents. It wasn't different for the academic library, uh, academic librarians. Um, I wanted to just share a few final thoughts that, um, as we've already heard today, there are uh, effective models that rely on academic library services and prisons. Um, but this work and more generally access to information is just very inconsistent and there are many challenges um, and there is potential to do much, much more. So um, I would just invite you to consider how your you or, or you and your affiliated academic or other library uh, may be able to engage in supporting higher education initiatives or other um, library initiatives related to prison. Uh, or, uh, or also those who are returning to your local community. And um, also take some time to look through the resources that we've gathered for the um, Information Justice Institute project. Uh, and please reach out if you have uh, any uh, questions or uh, comments. Thanks. <laughs>